You're watching ABC 10 Plus tonight. Hello, I'm Laura Painter. You're watching ABC 10 Plus tonight. A new digital ad is stirring up controversy in the Sacramento mayoral race. And in dollars and cents, the Financial Independence Retire Early, or FIRE movement, is flipping traditional ideas of work and retirement on its head. Then we get a look at the new food options coming to Golden One Center for game days or special events. ABC 10 Plus Tonight starts right now. And we are just 19 days away from Election Day. Tonight, the Sacramento mayoral race is heating up, and a new digital ad is stirring up a lot of controversy between the two candidates. ABC 10's Becca Hobbecker joins us right now in studio with a growing debate over homelessness and city parks. Yeah, that's for sure, Alex. You know, the ad addresses a number of topics, including one, whether, where, whether one candidate supports putting sanctioned homeless camps in city parks. More voters are hearing about this claim. Politico's California Playbook picked this up. I spoke with the candidates and did some fact checking. Two candidates are vying to become Sacramento's next mayor. They are public health professional Dr. Flo Kofer and assembly member Kevin McCarty, who released a digital ad this week. Says Flo called for new homeless encampments in our city parks. So I asked McCarty to clarify. Well, all throughout this campaign, we've heard this idea of using city parks underutilized city parks as homeless locations. I think it's a terrible idea. McCarty references comments like these from a candidate forum back in February as Kofer speaks in favor of safe ground sites, designated camping areas for the unhoused community with bathrooms and supportive services. I would prioritize putting safe ground in our underutilized parks. I'm going to emphasize underutilized because we have parks that are not being used that would be great places and allow me to explain why. Underutilized parks often have water hookups and electricity hookups, which means that we can allow people to actually attend to their basic needs. I asked Kofer to clarify what she means by underutilized parks. So I go to a lot of city meetings and I was at one where they were talking about underutilized parks, which were the, the empty lots that were one day going to potentially be parks, but right now they were empty lots. So when I was talking about this, I was using the language that I had heard at city meetings about this. So I thought I was providing clarity that these are not your neighborhood parks. These are empty lots that just one day are intended to eventually become parks. She accuses McCarty of misrepresenting her words to mislead voters. My opponent is now saying that we're trying to put people into our well-used everyday parks. That's simply not true. But there are empty lots that are listed on our parks list, and they are just that, empty lots. She did not offer a specific list of those lots. I don't support any city parks to be utilized for homeless facilities. More importantly, we have other places where they can be. We have uh, abandoned city uh, corporation yards. We have other locations throughout the city. Parks should be off limits. I asked each candidate their plan to address homelessness. One of the places we need to improve is coordination. So we have a lot of great people here who are doing important work, but we're not connected and so we're failing people. We have people going to our emergency rooms or our jails or calls for 911, but not getting connected into long-term services that exist here. So before we add any more money, I want us to look and see how can we better use the dollars we have and partner with one another so we get to real solutions. I think that we need to enforce the law. We can't have encampments throughout the city of Sacramento. I want to audit our city funding to make sure we're getting our biggest bang for our buck for every dollar we spend. We need to find appropriate places where we can have tiny homes, places people can camp. I think we need to focus on partnering more with the county. The county of Sacramento has 10 times more resources in the city on these issues. And lastly, look at behavioral health. I think certain individuals need to have treatment. Kevin McCarty's new ad also mentions funding for police. The candidates have differing approaches when it comes to addressing open positions within the police department and the allocation of funds. And you can hear more about that tomorrow. ABC 10, along with Telemundo, took the biggest issues and your questions to both candidates. Watch Sacramento's Future, the candidates for mayor, Thursday night at 6 p.m. Also streaming live on ABC 10+. Presidential elections can feel a little weird in California, and we're getting some questions about the reason why. The Electoral College, Bianca in Oakdale asked us, how does my vote help if the electoral votes are what matters? Are electoral votes only for president? 
Thank you, Bianca. And yes, electoral votes are only for the presidential race. The electors are going to meet in all of the states on December 17th to cast the actual votes for president in the Electoral College. Your vote matters because the popular vote in California decides who will get our 54 electoral votes. The political assumption is that Kamala Harris is going to win California because we're a blue state, but it only happens if more people cast ballots for her than Donald Trump come the November election. Given the political makeup of our state, it might not feel like your vote counts, but by law, it does. Your vote decides who gets California's electoral votes. And we do have more of those than any other state, which brings me to a related question we got from Mark in Folsom. He asked, you can win the majority vote, but still lose. How's that fair? Of course, that actually happened just back in 2016, and California is right at the heart of it. Donald Trump got 304 electoral votes, well above the 270 it takes to win the White House. He won even though Hillary Clinton beat him by 3 million votes nationwide. Guess which state all those votes came from? Right here, California. In fact, Clinton won California by more than 4 million votes. But it doesn't matter if you win California by one vote or by millions. All you can win are the electoral votes we actually have. As the most populated state, California has 52 seats in the House of Representatives, and we get an electoral vote for each and every one. We also get another two electoral votes for our two seats in the Senate. Now compare that to Wyoming, the least populated state. They only have one seat in the House, so one electoral vote for that. But as a state, they get the same two votes that we do for their two U.S. Senate seats. So really, your beef is with the U.S. Senate, Mark. The structure of the Senate gives more political power to the cows of Wyoming than the people of California. And that's what our election process is based on. It's not fair to California voters. The Electoral College is skewed against California more than any other state. The only thing fair about it is that both sides have to play the same game. They both know how many electoral votes each state has, and they both know it's going to take 270 to win. Great questions, Mark and Bianca. Thank you so much, and happy voting. On paper, Prop 34 is about controlling what it calls prescription drug price manipulators. But strap in, there's a lot more to this. In reality, Prop 34 exists as a way to hit back against the nonprofit group that wrote Prop 33. That's the rent control question that appears just before this one on your ballot. Prop 33 is the third attempt in recent elections to expand local rent control. Put forward by a group called the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. It's a huge nonprofit for AIDS prevention and treatment, but the foundation also advocates for affordable housing. The nonprofit reportedly made billions buying drugs for AIDS patients at a steep discount, but then billing health insurance the full price. That windfall comes from a federal drug discount program, and it's intended to help nonprofits to keep providing health care to lower income people. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation used some of the money it got to buy whole apartment buildings in LA. The housing arm of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation has come under fire for code violations in its buildings. There's a whole LA Times investigation about that. But the reason we're talking about it here is the AIDS Healthcare Foundation also spent hundreds of millions trying to get voters to approve more rent control, including Prop 33 this year. Hence, we have Prop 34. It's an attempt by California landlords to hit back. The California Apartment Association paid for Prop 34, trying to push the AIDS Healthcare Foundation to focus on health care and not housing. If Prop 34 passes, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation would have to spend at least 98% of the money it makes off the federal drug discount program on direct patient care. If not, the group could lose its license and nonprofit tax exempt status. In theory, these same penalties would apply to any other nonprofit that raises money similarly on federal drug reimbursements, spends at least $100 million on expenses other than patient care, and that owns and operates apartments with more than 500 severe code violations. We don't know of any other group that might qualify besides this one nonprofit. A yes vote on Prop 34 passes the spending restrictions on combined health care and housing nonprofits that participate in the federal drug discount program, and a no vote rejects the measure. In tonight's Dollars and Cents, we're talking fire. It means financial independence 
retire early. It's a growing movement that's flipping traditional ideas of work and retirement on their head. I talk with a local financial coach about how FIRE can work for you. Just talking about it has me feeling excited because I think a lot of times with, with money and finances, we feel that it's controlling us rather than us controlling it. That's what FIRE is all about, controlling your spending now to have more to enjoy later. FIRE stands for Financial Independence Retire Early, like really early. Imagine retiring at 45, even 35, instead of 65. Folks who really throw everything that they have at this FIRE goal, at the Financial Independence Retire Early goal, they're usually living very simply. Sacramento-based financial coach Maureen Paley says FIRE is a commitment that's not always easy, but can be worth the effort. Maybe they're not vacationing once or twice a year. Maybe they're not buying a new car every five years. So there's certain decisions that folks in this community will make so that they keep as much of that disposable income that they have and put it towards investing wisely so that they can leave the workforce early and they can have that financial comfort in the future. Anyone can live the FIRE lifestyle and everyone's goals look different, but it all comes down to planning and using investment tools you might already have, like a 401k or index funds. Their disposable income, which is what's left over after their bills are paid, their housing's paid, so on and so forth, that money is put in the service of growing more money, usually through investments, so that they can get to that goal much quicker. The difference between being financially savvy and the FIRE approach is the level of aggressiveness. While most people put 10 to 20 percent of their paycheck in their 401k, FIRE people might put 50 to 70 percent. We live in a time of temptation when it sure comes to do. consumerism, yeah. and yeah. it sounds like living this fire lifestyle is going to take a lot of willpower. It sure will. Mm -hmm. It will It will take a lot of willpower. But Paley says you can find motivation through the fire community, getting inspiration from other people also trying to live the fire lifestyle. When they see what's possible, and I think when they start seeing results after they start taking their first few steps towards that fire goal, they get really excited and really motivated. Fired up, as I like to say. Well, the sooner you start fire, the more time you'll have to build up your investments and ride out some market volatility. But there are still a lot of benefits if you put fire into practice, even if you're older. So mm -hmm. still a lot of takeaways. That is good to know. I was just <laughs> going to ask, how does it look for folks maybe closer to retirement age? Yeah, if you're 55, for example, uh, taking a more conservative approach makes a lot of sense since you don't have much time to ride out that market volatility. Everyone should take a close look at their retirement and what that means for you. Ask yourself, where will you live when you retire? Where will your income come from? Remember, this conversation doesn't end here. If you are part of the FIRE community and trying to retire early or know someone who is, send me an email at lpainter at abc10.com. You can also see all my dollars and cents stories on our free ABC10 Plus streaming app. Find it under the news section. The app is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Listen to this happening right now. Deputies are investigating after a man was shot and left in the middle of the street in Placer County. It happened near Riego and Pleasant Grove Road. ABC 10's Roxanne Elias is there live. And Roxanne, I understand you just got an update from investigators. Chris, I just spoke to the spokesperson with the Placer County Sheriff's Office. She tells me that the property has been cleared at this time and that there is no one here as they investigate what happened in this shooting earlier today. They were searching the entire property, the home and uh, several buildings here. This all started around 730 this morning after a caller reported a man who had been shot lying in the middle of the road. When deputies got there, they found a 51 year old victim shot in the lower body. He was taken to the hospital and is expected to survive. The sheriff's office says the shooting is not believed to be random and the two individuals involved know each other. Earlier, people who live nearby were asked to come out and a man and two women complied. For everyone's safety though, the sheriff's office was using their special enforcement team to make sure no one else was inside. We spoke with Nathaniel Offer, 
who works down the street, he says most people who are passing through this part of town just drive through to go towards Roseville or they use it for dumping or illegal camping. It's a little bit shocking that somebody was shot. Um, not 100% um, surprising in the sense that there's a lot of, um, in my opinion, drug activity in this area. The Placer County Sheriff's Office is working to now wrap things up here. They tell me no suspects or suspect has been arrested. They're asking people if they know anything or have any information on the shooting to reach out to the Sheriff's Office. I'm live out here in West Placer County, Roxanne Elias, ABC 10. Still a very active scene there, so stay with us for updates on air and online at abc10.com. Roxanne, thank you. Well, PG&E workers who traveled across the nation to help with hurricane recovery efforts are now back home tonight. ABC 10's Alicia Machado was at the Sacramento International Airport as they returned. Coming in for landing and some much needed rest. PG&E crews flying into Sacramento International Airport Wednesday after helping restore power to communities devastated by recent hurricanes. First going to Georgia to help with Hurricane Helene storm recovery, putting in utility poles, stringing power lines, getting people back on with power, and later shifted to Central Florida as Hurricane Milton approached. The storms leaving millions across the southeast without power. Chris Hayes from Lodi was among the 400 workers deployed by PG&E. It was cool just to go there and just just to help out the people that lost almost some people everything, some people little, but everyone else was even after almost losing everything. They were super, super just happy to see us. Employees from across the state taking the call to help, including from Stockton, Auburn and Placerville. The buses lining the airport ready to take them home. Glad to see my wife and get home and see my boys. Just spend some quality time with the family and decompress a little bit. PG&E workers and families in the parking lot to greet them on their return. PG&E says crews logged more than 16,000 hours during their deployment to support utility companies out there with repair work. To restore power to people who have been without power for more than a week and who uh, really relied on that power to get their lives back together. In Sacramento, Alicia Machado, ABC 10. And PG&E says this is the largest mutual assistance deployment for the company. They also sent crews to help during other hurricanes, including Maria and Irma, back in 2017. Meanwhile, there was a bit of shaking at Sacramento State. The California Great or the Great California Shakeout Tour made a stop on the campus today. The earthquake simulator is used to give the public a feel for what it's like to experience a 7.0 earthquake. Cal OES is visiting three California counties to provide life-saving earthquake tips. We are indeed a land of extremes, and so I do want to turn to Monica now with the weather impact alert impacting the region for at least, what, the next few days. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, this October is shaping up to be very active. It certainly has, with record highs earlier this month, and now we're heading into a more active period in terms of our fire danger. Here's a look at the headlines that we're tracking. We've now gone past tracking showers. Now it's gusty dry winds, possible power issues, as well as the fire weather concerns that are kind of brewing in the next 24 hours. As far as the rainfall, well, it's moved off to the east. A few scattered showers remain throughout this year and a few snow showers at the very highest elevations there. Cold system, though, moving through behind it, and it is going to drop those temperatures for tonight. The low that is guiding all of this will still be a part of the forecast, not so much in the term in terms of showers, but it's all part of the dynamic shaping up across the west. That's going to give us the gusty winds tomorrow. We'll just see a few clouds to start us off for the day. A few very light showers possible north of I 80 and then a slight chance of seeing a few snow flurries there throughout the Sierra. This isn't going to amount to too much, but be prepared for changing conditions in the Sierra. Once we get out of that weather system there into our Thursday, we start to drive into our wind event. And this is going to ramp up pretty rapidly here through our Thursday with our wind advisory going into effect at 11 p.m. And then our red flag warning will also go into effect at 11 p.m. tomorrow. This is going to be a much wider region here under that red flag warning because of the lowering humidity levels. We're going to see that linger into our Saturday. 
big mountain backyard right now. Sunny skies. We've got temperatures in the 70s, still dealing with the cloud cover and a few scattered showers there for Tahoe right now at 49. A look at that active weather pattern. How are things going to unfold here in the next 24 hours? We've got that building ridge of high pressure. That's what gets us the dry conditions, but also that low isn't quite out of our reach. And so when we're squeezed right in between those two, we get those dry and gusty winds. And at this time of year, as Laura's mentioned, it's a very dangerous time of year because of how dry everything is, especially when we didn't have a whole lot of accumulated rain for today. Now let's get to those future wind gusts ramping up tomorrow evening. This is the time that everything starts to really go into effect. It's going to stay with us for our Friday morning commute, even into our Friday evening forecast. Wind gusts still at about 25 to 30 miles per hour. And then we get another little pulse here early Saturday before every Everything starts to wind down roughly after the noontime hour. But again, those winds drawing us out. We go from humidity at about 25% on Thursday evening down to the single digits by Friday evening. Highs for tomorrow in the 50s for this year, a 50s and 60s for the foothills. Tomorrow really early in the day is the time to be prepared. Maybe bring in some of those holiday decorations as well. 70s along the coast, 70s inland as we make our way through our middle of the work week here. Morning lows start us off in the low 50s. It's going to be a crisp start there. Just a slight chance of a lingering shower for the mountains. Otherwise dry and windy here for the rest of the work week into the start of the weekend. And that's why we have this weather impact alert in place through Saturday. Expand Standing on to the 10 day forecast. No rain out there, nothing extreme, just all eyes on that wind event there. Hey, I'm Kevin John. Well, if you ask me, there's nothing like small town high school sports. And over in Clarksburg, on the campus of Delta High School, is a volleyball team that's not only blazing their own trail, but taking down whoever gets in their way. Well, just because we're a small school, even though we're small, because we're smaller, coming from a small school, because we're so small. Yes, they may be from a small school, but don't think for one second you're going to push them around. Because we're fierce and we're small. Because we're smaller, I feel like we want it more. It's the drive. Like, we want to win because what else is there to talk about here? And winning is something they've been doing a lot of this year. After winning just four matches total last season, this team is on pace to triple that win total in addition to being playoff bound. So what's the reason for their success this year? I think we just, our relationship with each other is so much better this year. This year we're just like tighter and it, as you can see there's not that many people so like everyone knows each other. For sure the chemistry, we have way better responses, we have way better communication. And it also helps when you have a coach who can connect with their athletes. I like to think of my coaching style as a player's coach. I'm not overly disciplined, um, but we do definitely have fun and we definitely do work hard. The school only has about 200 students and the community rallies around them. It's just great to see such a community come together. Clarksburg definitely is a hometown community. Everyone just knows each other and so it's just so warming to see everyone at all the games. It's always the same supporters. Everyone's just cheering loud and everything. The Saints hope to make a deep playoff run this year, and they refuse to let anything hold them back. Why should other schools fear the Delta Saints? We're coming. We're in it to win it. That's why. We're locked in. That's our mindset. We're on it. We want to win. We're going to win. Well, the countdown is on. We're just eight days away from the Sacramento Kings home opener. Today, the Kings showcased their new menu items with local connections for the 2024-2025 season. And ABC 10's Devin Truby had the, shall we say, difficult job <laughs> of trying the new creations this season. Take a look. The Sacramento Kings are hungry for the 2024-2025 NBA season to start, and hopefully so are the fans. <laughs> Golden One Center shaking up their menu this year with eight new items and this King's cocktail in a collectible cup. Let's rock and roll. So, Executive Chef Brian Kuznicki introducing a Thai curry chicken bowl, chicken gyro, and porchetta sandwich. Bringing back the old 
Great hits right here is the Borchetta sound. And even if the Kings lose, you can light the beam, but with a churro instead. Embracing the theme of home cooked foods for a home court comfort with grilled ham and cheese, grilled cheese, and chocolate chip cookies. But the classics, really, kind of that southern comfort feel, you know. Uh, it's similar to how everyone feels when they come into the Golden One Center. So I'm trying to replicate that in our food. Chef Kuznicki's favorite creation this year is the beef dip with au jus featuring a roll baked in Davis at Village Bakery. But if you want your mouth to roar like Slamson, go for the new Cajun chicken sandwich. It's also John Reinhardt, president of business operations favorite. Reinhardt says they're excited to have Farm to Fork take center court. We have 90% of the food and beverage that we serve here comes from within 150 miles of Golden One Center. After a major success last year, the King's pop-up kitchen will return, giving local small businesses a chance to serve up their specialty. It's really your time to shine and see uh, what you got. I mean, I if I were an inspiring chef, I would definitely encourage everyone to take a look and, and jump on it. It's a great opportunity to to see what it takes and see how you fare with 17,000 hungry fans. The Kings had the pop-up events last year at theme nights, including Black History Month, Lunar New Year, Women's Empowerment Night, and more. These new treats will be available at all home games and select Golden One Center events at the plaza and bridge levels. Reporting in Sacramento, Devin Truby, ABC 10. Well, our friend Marcus Allen seems to already be in the spirit, but we are 15 days away from Halloween, which means you might be on the hunt for a, uh, a haunted house, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, something like what we have here. Yes. So Heartstopper's Haunted House is the largest indoor haunted house in the Sacramento area, and it's been a mainstay in Rancho Cordova for over 17 years. Now it's back at its original location, and the aforementioned Mark S. Allen has more on the frightening landmark from the mine shaft. Yeah, you guys, I love getting to preview haunted houses. I hate doing it when they're not technically open. It makes them a little bit more scary. In the meantime, welcome to Heartstoppers, one of the largest haunts in California, 17 years in operation. Check it out. It's two stories tall in the old mine shaft building here in Rancho Cordova. It's a co-op with the city. It's extra creepy and extra special. Want to know more about it? That's pretty much all I know. So, Candace, help me out. Uh, Candace, you know this joint like the back of your hand. I do. What's the scariest room? Oh, depends on what your fear is. Got it. Uh, how many years have you been doing this? Um, I've been here about six years. And why do you do this? I what? love it. Yeah, exactly. I always ask people who love doing this, why do you love terrifying people? Um, I love being here. It's like a weird little family. I get to be creepy and weird once a year. Nobody judges. And... Um, it's just awesome. Right, now in a moment, we're going to go into this room behind us, maybe a couple. In the meantime, take a look at all that you're going to see when you come here. How many different rooms do you know? So we have four different haunts that our guests can experience. We have the ward we're about to go through. We have one downstairs that is blacked out. And we have two outside, our Blightwoods and our Deadlands. And as mentioned earlier, we have a bunch of awesome stuff outside as well before you even come in. Trust me, this place has been here long enough. There are probably some real dead people haunting it. All right, let's push on through. Here we go. You ready? ready? Here we go. I'm not scared. You're scared. Why are you so scared? <laughs> All right, I'm a little scared. Where are we going now? So, All right, so we're going to enter the ward right now. Yeah, yeah. Let's, All right. Let's go right here in the ward. In the ward. I think I know these people. All right. You know what scares me the most? Plastic tarping. And the sounds. Kind of scary. Oh! No customers! Come on! Ten limbs at a time! It'll be fun! Come on! Sign I used to work for her. Alright. Here we go. Don't let them take my baby! We're not gonna let him take your baby. We're gonna get out of here. Alright, it's gonna be right. yeah. Awesome. You know, with every turn, I start to see stuff that no one on morning television should watch. Hours of operation? Hours of operation are Friday, Saturday. We open at 7.30. Tickets are online only, so make sure you visit our website, visit our f and and get your tickets before they sell out. Awesome. So make it heart stoppers. Happy haunting. Tis the season. And back to you. Some of you wondering if Marcus Allen is okay and safe? The answer is we don't know. Thank you so much for watching ABC 10 Plus tonight. We're here 24-7 on the free ABC 10 Plus app. You can get your news and weather anytime, anywhere. I'm Laura Painter. See you next time.
I'm ABC 10's Chris Thomas. And I'm Telemundo's Miriam Villarreal. Sacramento voters will be making a big decision this November. They will be choosing the city's next mayor. We're taking the biggest issues and your questions to both candidates. I want you to talk about whether or not you support clearing homeless encampments. To be clear, you have 30 seconds. Watch Sacramento's Future, the candidates for mayor, Thursday night at 6 p.m. Also streaming live on ABC 10 Plus.